Um, <clears throat> well, you know, last, last week we uh, really got into, uh, in chapter 8, uh, the victories that David um, had, and we've seen over and over again that God was uh, giving David uh, victory over his, in, uh, his enemies. It was a time, it was a kind of a short synopsis like I told you last week. Um, it was a summary of things that had happened um, and not the entirety of those stories. We'll start to get into those uh, a little on uh, next week and as it, it kind of draws it uh, out. But we've just seen how David, time and time again, uh, the Lord was having him to be victorious uh, over his enemies. Well, this week in 2 Samuel 9, uh, we're going to see how David uh, keeps his word. Um, and I think when you take a look in your Bibles, it probably puts a heading out there of David uh, and Mephibosheth. Um, but uh, I think the overarching thing that we're going to see uh, is how, how faithful David is uh, and how he keeps his word. So uh, let's take a look at the first five verses uh, this morning. This morning, this <laughs> tonight. It says, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and, <clears throat> and the king. Said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, uh, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. Now, uh, last chapter, as I said, we were seeing how David had these victories uh, over, over his enemies. Now he is enjoying uh, all of those the events, you know, you're kind of putting them in perspective. And David is having this short period, at least, of, of peace. Uh, he is not really uh, in the middle of battling uh, people. Those victories have been over. And he's kind of sitting back um, and, and really thinking about a lot of stuff. Uh, and we see in verses 1 and in verse 3, uh, as David is reflecting on these other obligations that he has outside of just fighting battles, that he asks this question um, of who is left uh, in the house of Saul. And he says in verse 1, the reason he's asking that question is so he can show kindness for Jonathan's sake, all right? So you remember when we were reading in 1 Samuel, there was a couple of instances when the interaction between Jonathan and David uh, to where they made oaths to one another. Uh, and, and Jonathan had asked David, uh, if you will just make sure you take care of my family, remember my family. And David agreed that you know, he was going to look after uh, Jonathan's family wise. David's sitting here and he's thinking about all his obligations. This is on his mind that he had told Jonathan that he would uh, take care of his family. Well, he asked though, right here, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? He asked a, a wider tent question because David really did not have any ideas uh, necessarily about whether Jonathan had family that was left. So he was even willing uh, to anybody uh, that had have been left in Saul's family, uh, even if it wasn't a direct descendant of Jonathan's, um, and that he wanted to bless them uh, for Jonathan's sake. So uh, as he goes, we see that he uh, uh, finds Ziba, uh, who was a servant of King Saul. Uh, he summons him uh, and then he asked him that same question in verse 3. And he says, well, yeah. Yeah, there's actually a son of Saul left. He doesn't name him, you know, in here yet. Um, he says, there is still a son of Jonathan, uh, but he's lame in both feet. Uh, did you put up uh, uh, first name before 4, Joe? Uh, he, I'm sorry, he didn't do it. Uh, but remember when we were looking, and I think it's 2 Samuel. I wrote that wrong. It's 2 Samuel 4-4. Uh, four, four. Um, but we've seen just, you know, several weeks back 
um, where there was a little blip in there about Mephibosheth, uh, Mephi um, and that he, when he was born, and then, thank you, Joe got it pretty quick. Uh, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. Um, that was all we knew when we studied chapter 4 about Mephibosheth. And I told you we'd pick up his story um, a little later, and, and here we are. But you, uh, when Jonathan and, and uh, Saul and them fell in the battle, and the, and the Philistines um, <clears throat> were taking over them and whatnot, um, and then we seen his, his nurse was running with him, dropped him. I guess he landed in such a way on his feet that it broke uh, both of us in a way that he could no longer uh, walk. So when you pick back up, uh, it, and it tells us here uh, in verse 3, there's still a son of Jonathan, he is lame in both feet. And David asks him, where is he? And he tells him where he was. And actually it had told us uh, in verse 5 of uh, chapter 4 where he was. So that all this is sinking back up. So let's look at verses 6 through 7. It says, when Mephibosheth, uh, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he, reply, uh, he replied, don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Um, I say, I ask you in your notes, what did Mephibosheth uh, have to be afraid of? Getting slaughtered? Getting slaughtered? Yeah, when you deposed the king, he typically went around and slaughtered all of his sons and heirs because hmm. you didn't want them to overthrow you and take the throne back. Hmm. So his fear at the time was that he would be slaughtered. Yeah, when the king has sent for him, he is in fact the you know, her hereditary heir to the throne. Um, the other kids and all have, have died. We've already watched Isbosheth, remember? Uh, and he, uh, he woke up dead. Um, and, and so here you thought, and I don't know why they had to name these kids such terrible names, you know. <laughs> Isbosheth and Mephibosheth. Uh, and all of that, but that's their names anyway. Um, but here he is, and, and he falls down. I mean, obviously, you know, I don't know exactly how he was standing up or, or however he was there, but he's not only falling down just because of reverence to the king, he's scared. Um, and so you can imagine he's trembling uh, uh, and whatnot, and David is calming him down. You know, don't be afraid. Um, and then he tells him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. Then he says, I'm going to restore you, to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. Now, what land? I mean, Saul as the king, that's the entire kingdom. Is David saying, I'm going to give you the entire kingdom? How do you know that? Sometimes when you read the Bible, you have to use common sense, <laughs> okay? Uh, he's not telling him, I'm going to give you the entire kingdom. The land that Saul owned, his family home, if you will, the house he was at with his daddy, remember when we seen him, and, and that family land that Saul's per personal family would have had uh, that would have then got swallowed up in his uh, uh, kind of uh, privilege that he had as king, he was going to give him back that family plot of land. All that family that your, your grandfather Saul uh, owned. And, and he's going to give him this land. And then he says, you will always eat at my, at my table. This is considered to be very, very high honor uh, to, be able to eat at the king's table. And he doesn't just tell him. I mean, it was high honor to eat at the king's table once in your life. But he says, you will always eat at my table. Now here, you can see this crippled man at this point. 
uh, crippled man, he's, he's here, he was scared. He's heard this from the king. This is, this is like getting, you know, ordering sweet tea and, and getting salsa water, you know. It is not what he thought was going to happen, uh, okay. And so he's a little shocked. He stands up. Uh, or gets up, I'm not, maybe he didn't stand up, but he's, he, he, he kind of gets more alert looking at David than what I imagined. And in verse 8, it says, Mephibosheth, he bowed down and said, because he's already down prostrate, and I, then I think he's looking up, and then he's hanging his head back down, you know, again. And he said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? What's the significance? Go back there to verse 8 for me, Joe. I want to hang out here for just a second before I read the whole thing. What's the significance of, of him saying this? What, why use this imagery? But why say dead dog? We treat our dogs today. Uh, we, pay, we pay bukus of money. Uh, to, to get our pets groomed and cleaned and take them to the vet and our little snickerdoodles and all of them dogs and stuff like that. We love them things. That's culturally, we can't possibly identify with just how low he was saying himself was. He has no self-esteem. Huh? Ma'am? What would you say, Diane? Yeah, I want you to understand, though, in this, the cultural difference. When you're reading the Bible, sometimes you cannot read this as how would a person in 2021 understand a dead dog, but how would a person uh, reading God's Word in ancient times understand a dog was a lowly animal that nobody cared anything about. They were vile, useless animals. And a dead one was even worse. <laughs> okay. Back then, though, if you had any kind of infirmity or something was wrong with you, you were almost cursed. Sure. So I'm sure that he wanted a lot of self pity and probably had a lot of. Um, well, as you said. Yeah, sure. As you said a while ago, he had no self-esteem already. But what I'm, what I was bringing out in this is the the dead dog. If you study out that context of what they thought, you know, it was it was basically like what we would say today that he felt like a dead rat. You know, we consider a rat a pretty. Some of you in here may have some pet rats at the house. I'm not sure, so I don't know. But I doubt that you. I doubt that you do. Um, but you know, over time, it may be in some years that everybody's gonna, you know, have have nice big rats and they get them groomed and cleaned and stuff like we. That's what we've done with dogs. I mean, we've elevated what used to be this lowly animal that nobody cared of. They would have just killed it in a minute's notice. And now, you know, they have a million dollars paid for dogs and stuff. But these folks had no use for dogs. And he's saying, I'm the lowest of the low. Uh, what is your servant that you, not that you should do this for me, that you should even notice me? So you know, as Linda was saying, that he didn't have high regard for himself, and, and you can see that in the context of anybody having any kind of ailment, whether you had a disease or whether you had any kind of physical deformity, if you were not almost perfect, especially a man uh, in such a family uh, in the court, in the king's uh, you know, uh, court, you were expected to be a fighting person, and, uh, and nobody that was crippled in their feet could have done, could have done that. So he, 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 has felt, he feels bad about himself, but he goes on in verse 9, and it says, Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. So again, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. So that gives you the context of this track of land there he's getting. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servants to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. 
And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. All right. Uh, so uh, he, he, he was of royal blood, uh, but I, and I say here in your notes, but he didn't think highly of himself. He thought he was a dead dog. Uh, I asked what he means by this. We've already talked uh, about what he means by that. David is ordering Ziba and his family and his servants to go work this land. And it tells you that Ziba had 15 sons. That's a lot of sons. Okay. Um, 15 sons and he had 20 servants. So this is a good amount of folks uh, to be out here working the land. They were working that what does it mean to provide for him? Didn't need food. He's eating at the king's table. What does it mean to provide for him? Yeah, I mean, they didn't have what we have today. They, I mean, you, you, a crippled man couldn't work for himself. He didn't have money to buy anything that he would have needed outside of food and clothes or any of that stuff. He was living with somebody else before David's taking him from that. He's giving him this place. But David certainly couldn't have just put him by himself, you know, in, in a house with a track of land. Uh, and so they were going to provide for him uh, in every way. So he, it's the best social security program that's ever happened, you know, to a person. And, and, and I don't know what, it should have been living in a pretty decent circumstance where he was before, but he has just, uh, you know, uh, been blessed, you know, beyond compare. They're going to take care of him. All of his needs are going uh, to be met uh, by these people who they were the servants of his grandfather. They're going to serve him. And, uh, and then, as I say, he's living in Jerusalem and he's going to eat at the king's table. He was not necessarily living on this track of land. That was providing him his source of income and his provisions. He was in Jerusalem eating at the king's table every day as if he was a son of King David. Now, last question that I have on your paper. What can we learn from this chapter and how can we apply it to our lives today? And I want you to think about David uh, in this. All right. I see David's compassion and um, his honorable behavior, <clears throat> and he's doing this. I think he says up here to show God's kindness. Mm. David's showing his kindness, but he's showing God's kindness. God was kind to David. David was a shepherd boy. Yeah. He was blessed, but in turn, he's keeping his word to Jonathan, which is an honorable thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. What'd you say, Philip? Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it was a reiteration of, yeah. Yeah, of it. this is him keeping basically his word to Jonathan. Yeah, think about, though, think about the distance that it's been between when David promised that stuff and agreed and what's happened to David before. What, what, what kind of position was David in when he made the promises? He was living paycheck to paycheck running around, scared for his life. He's making an agreement with the son of the king that he is running from his life with, right? Under those kinds of duress, normal men and women say anything, right? He could have just said anything to garner Jonathan's favor. Jonathan helped him. Jonathan did help him. Jonathan's dead. David has now become not only king of Judah, but king of all Israel. God has given him all of the victories. He is on the mountaintop. Isn't it normally true 
that when, let's think about this in the form of a modern day politician. I'm serious. I'm studying Samuel because I want us to look at government from the Bible. Modern day politicians make all kind of promises on the stump, don't they? What happens when they get there? They, I don't know that they forget them. They for May, and may, they overpromise and underdeliver, you know, and they get up there and they start to usually just think about themselves. That, that's what the problem is. They start saying, well, I, got to, I can't do what I said because I got to win that next election. You know, if I'm in the House, I got two years. If I'm in the Senate, I got six. If I'm the President, I got four. And it's not four because you got to start campaigning 24 months before. You know, all that stuff sometimes at least 12 months before. And they're thinking about the next elections of what they're going to do. Somebody say something. Yeah, they, 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 they do say that. But I was trying to get elected. They, they actually admit it now. But here you would have even thought, not just in a politician, but when somebody finally gets up, this in a marriage, you know, oh, you say everything before you, oh, baby, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to be this way. And just when you reach the, you know, the pinnacle of wherever you are, everybody just sits back and goes, well, you know. And David made a promise. He made a promise to Jonathan. He did not forget it. He didn't sit back and say, you know what? I'm thinking all about myself. I've reached this glory. Jonathan's dead. I don't even know if he's got any kids. Yeah. Huh? He could have just said, oh, you know, that was so long ago. There has been quite a few years that's passed uh, between these times. That's, that's yesterday. Who will know? Everybody's dead. And he, and, but David, you used the word honorable earlier uh, about David, is he made a promise, he made a commitment, he's sitting there looking at all his blessings, and he didn't get wrapped up in that. Isn't that something? They actually had a covenant. They did have a covenant. But he could have easily got wrapped up in himself, which Saul did. Saul did, huh? He could have said, I'm at the top now, I'm the king, I can do what I want. I'm the king. That is normal what happens. That's what happens. Saul did it. Saul was a good man, seemed like, you know, before he got to be king, and then he just, it's all downhill from there. And here David, that's why I titled this, you know, David keeps his word, but David got there, and he was not just thinking about himself. He looked at all the blessings that God had given him. We looked, you know, in the last chapter, uh, as it said that God... You know, was delivering. Uh, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Okay? Um, and David understands the importance of being faithful to God. It wasn't just a promise that he made to Jonathan. They made a covenant before the Lord, uh, you know, to each other. Um, and he's looking around going, look how blessed I am. And you know why I'm here? That's true. But why was David there humanly? The human being that is responsible for David still being alive and where he is at at that moment was Jonathan. Why wouldn't he have kept that promise? Why wouldn't he have been thinking about it right then as he's thinking about what all God is doing and what God has done for him and he's looking back knowing that if it hadn't have been for Jonathan, God using Jonathan, obviously, we all know that, uh, but God using Jonathan, David would not be sitting here in the peace that he's at, God giving him everything he desired and all of those things. And what he said was, I better <laughs> keep my end of the bargain because this is God um, and this is what God uh, has done. We, that is lost in our world today. That kind of loyalty and commitment to your word or commitment to, to anything that you say. We live in such a shameful society today.
that nobody can sell anything without having eight ways for you to get every dollar of your money back. It's like you can buy a Coca-Cola, drink the whole bottle, say you don't like it, and Coca-Cola's got to give you your money back. You know, it's ridiculous. Nobody makes a commitment today that they'll stand on. You want to lend somebody money, we got to make you have, you know, 12 you know, lawyers write up this agreement that says that we can take your life you know, and you still can get out of that kind of stuff today. The people's word today means absolutely nothing for the most part, for the most part. Um, and, and David, and it was the same kind of stuff then. I mean, people were lying, cheats, and, and all of that kind of stuff. People, human beings have not changed, but having somebody like David, isn't that something that we can learn from today? If we're certainly going to make a commitment to the Lord, how many times have you, you bargained with the Lord? Lord, if you'll just do this, I'll do that. You know? First of all, I don't, I don't play that game no more. I don't tell him, Lord, if you do, I'll move. No, I say, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, and please, if you will, do something else, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out there and do it. Because if you say, God, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to serve you as soon as you bless me one more time. You're going to be sitting there waiting a long, long time. He said, follow me, you know, not him follow you. Not going, well, I'm going to see where they go, and maybe I'll do it then. Uh, he's not behind you. Uh, looking, looking like that. But David, David recognizes uh, in this, uh, I, I'm telling you, David's sitting there and he recognizes uh, the source of his blessings. Obviously, that's God. He has been fierce uh, about serving God first, right? He, the first thing David went to do was to say, why am I living in a house of cedar and God's in a, in a, in a tent? So you see, his first priority went to God. And then as, as he sat there for a little bit, then he's looked and he, he goes, I have, I have commitments to my family and commitments to my friends, uh, to the people that surrounded him. And you see him honor, you know, that. So a short chapter of, of 13 verses like this, I can tell you, David, as I say, is going to make mistakes. Uh, we're going to read that. We've seen a few of them already in our study. But... Uh, Observe yourself a little bit at how, you know, can, can people rely on you to keep your word um, when you say that you're going uh, to do something uh, and, you, and, and people have, you know, uh, uh, made a, a bond like that uh, that Jonathan and them uh, did? And, and are you going to mind, God, are you going to, or do you think about the sources where you are? Or have you kind of reached this plateau to where you say, look, I'm so blessed. I'm, I, I got myself here by myself and nobody helped me, God, or none of these other people that are out there. Hopefully that's nobody uh, that, 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 is, that is in here. David certainly knew. But it is in the world today when you see everybody who is just praising themselves, patting their back, man, I did such a good job. Tell me I did such a good job. They want that validation for themselves. And David, at all the power he's got in his hand right now, uh, at this moment in our study, he is still fiercely loyal and honorable, uh, and he sold out to God Almighty. Uh, and I think we can learn uh, from that and how he's, how he's living uh, at this time and apply that stuff uh, to our life uh, because I can tell you, we may not be kings and queens of whole realms of things, but God, as I just told y'all earlier, uh, just about how, what God has done in our church. God blesses us tremendously. And I tell you, we better be careful to mind what he says and to not forget, not forget, not to be so wrapped up in our blessings that we forget who is the source of those things and, and, and to make sure we keep our, keep our word and that we serve the Lord and we, we do what we told him. And when you become a Christian, whether you know it or not, if you wear that, that, that title, Christian, it means that you are going to be a Christ follower, that you are going to uh, model yourself after the Lord Jesus Christ. You're telling God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to you know, die to myself. I'm going to change. I'm going to do all these things. You make a commitment uh, to the Lord of sanctification, and he expects us 
uh, to live to live that out. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not always easy, but it sure is worth it. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, I do praise you and I thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word tonight. And uh, Lord, as we see uh, King David <clears throat> in, in this chapter, uh, Father, uh, we had just a, a brief introduction uh, chapters ago of Mephibosheth, uh, Lord, and not really knowing exactly uh, how those things are going to play out in that chapter, Father, we can see uh, why we were introduced, or we can see why um, he's so important, Father, uh, in, this, in the context of, of this book. Lord, to keep David um, uh, honest, Lord, to keep him in an honorable uh, uh, way, Lord, he, he, he was, Lord, minding you by trying to find a member of Saul's family. And Lord, I think that it is easy for us to imagine that most worldly-minded people in David's situation would have killed this man. They would have, he would have looked at him as a threat to his power. Uh, Lord, uh, even if he chose to bother with him at all because he was crippled. But Father, we see uh, David in this be gracious and merciful in a way, Lord, that emulates the grace and mercy that you bestow upon every single one of us every day. Father, as I read this chapter, Lord, I, I can identify with Mephibosheth, Lord, that we, we can look to you, and Father, we can say, why would you even notice us? Lord, we, we, can, we can identify, Lord, with uh, thinking of ourselves, Lord, and especially when we compare what we deserve. Father, we are as dead dogs. But Father, you have chosen to raise us up to the highest place, to be co-heirs with you, to reign with you, to bestow blessings uh, and honor on us, Lord, that we could never even imagine. And Father, because you made a promise. And Lord, if we have accepted your son, Jesus Christ, as our personal savior, if we live for you, Lord, you tell us uh, that we shall not perish, but we, we should have everlasting life, Lord, that you will uh, make us to be co-heirs with you. And Father, you, you keep that promise every single day. And Lord, I pray that as we are blessed in this life, Lord, as we're blessed in this church, uh, Father, that we would not gloat, uh, Lord, we wouldn't get on high horses personally, Lord, or, or otherwise, uh, Father, but we would constantly keep our eyes focused, Lord, on you uh, in our individual lives, Lord, as we come together in this church, uh, Father, and we can uh, do what you have instructed us to do, and we can be your examples and your witness in this world, uh, and we can be your hands and your feet, Father. We thank you uh, for every blessing. Uh, that you bestow down upon us, Father. And we want to be good stewards of the blessings that you give us. Go with us, Lord, as we leave this place tonight. Keep us safe. Uh, Lord, bring everybody back here on Sunday as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.